and welcome to the human robot introduction class. So on the first lecture today, we will uh, look at robots and human robot interaction from a historical perspective. We'll look at where we stand uh, from the beginning with respect to robots or automated agents and how uh, human robot interaction evolved over time in uh, different geographic regions. And uh, on that, we will look at the modern uh, progress on uh, similar field on robots and human robot interaction. And we will uh, <coughs> look at some uh, existing case study. So uh, we will first look back at the history of computing, automata, and the terms robot, Android, which were uh, we refer now to refer to automated agents. And also we will look at computers, uh, AI and ARVR because these are all uh, come together when we talk about uh, human robot interaction. And in particular, we will look at a case study on using extended reality medium uh, or ex uh, immersive media to control a robotic agent. And I will uh, kind of present it chronologically so it clears that how we ourselves developed uh, similar technology in our lab from during the last uh, three years. So uh, you, uh, most of you already know me. Uh, I'm presently affiliated with this CPDM and uh, Robert Bosch Center for Cyber Physical System, and I do some work at uh, ITU on. <clears throat> drafting a new recommendation on uh, common user profile. Maybe we will uh, talk about that later in the course that making uh, audiovisual media accessible and which will also touch upon our uh, topic on uh, developing uh, human robot interactions for people with uh, different range of abilities. And I earlier uh, undertook my PhD in computer science uh, from uh, Trinity College of University of Cambridge and presently involved with various projects. And this is one picture from our graduation ceremony, which was pretty elaborated at that time. And um, I acknowledge my sources for today's lecture. So mostly these two books, uh, Gods and Robots by Adrian Mayer and these uh, medieval robots, uh, both are uh, good books to read. And um, I advise that if you, any of you want to uh, work on uh, robotics, you may check out these books. And then I took uh, several resources from different uh, Wikipedia pages. So let's first uh, look at one uh, statement by Isidore of Seville, uh, who was a famous scholar and historian. And I am just uh, uttering this statement that history refers to events that did happen, drama to events that did not happen but could have, and fabula to events that could not have happened because they recount things that are contrary to nature. And in the remaining part of the lecture, what you will see that whatever exists as a mythology or fabula, how they gradually started to realize and then maybe after a uh, hundred years, maybe fifty years, that becomes a reality and uh, commonplace objects. On left hand side, you can see a picture. So uh, this is uh, known as Ishango Bon or something like that, and uh, considered as the first computing instrument uh, developed by mankind. So. So far, I remember it's from the time of Stone Age, recovered in the Belgian Congo and presently at a museum in Brussels. This is just a piece of bone which has 29 marking on it. So sometimes people just uh, skeptic and tell that this uh, marking are uh, just to get a better grip on the piece of bone, but others uh, tell that these markings help to use this uh, bone as abascus and even some went on saying that this 29 marking was uh, related to the 29 lunar days. But most uh, people agree that uh, it perhaps be the first computing instrument used and recovered by uh, mankind. So although we talk about robot, but uh, robot was a relatively new term. We will see later on in the lecture. The first 
reference to automated object with uh, self moving part uh, goes back to greek mythology and in according to greek mythology this uh, hephaestus uh, he was uh, a greek god of blacksmiths metal working very similar to uh, the hindu god of uh, vishwakarma and homer you may remember uh, homer's name in the context of iliad and odyssey so he referred that that hephaestus uh, made wheeled servants and female assistants for the gods which were uh, automated androids for guarding god and also uh, the female assistants were endowed with a sense of uh, speech and strength later on making of this uh, automata or automated agents it uh, further uh, um, it was further uh, worked on at the alexandrian school or at the alexandra and uh, this uh, it sivius uh, or it sivius um, sorry about I, <laughs> my pronunciation so he can be considered as the first roboticist and uh, i also put the <coughs> chronology or the year in uh, most of the slides so this is we are talking about uh, bc 3rd century and he wrote manuals on force palm catapult powered by compressed air water powered organs pneumatic birds in the right side you can see some of the picture so automated agents with uh, self sustaining or self Uh, manufactured components uh, which can generate motion moving on uh, hero of alexandria he is maybe the first person who wrote a book on automated uh, automata making so still see we are talking about automata we have not uttered the word robot and he is uh, some of his uh, marvels was the mobile shrine of dancers a small fixed theater which automatically can show a tragedy and he also devised mechanism to convert one type of motion into another you can on the right side you can see a, a left side you can see a snapshot of his book and uh, this uh, this uh, wind organ which can automatically play uh, when this uh, wheels move this ar will uh, come into these organs and it will keep on playing automatically so this antikythera mechanism it was recovered in the aegean sea near greece and uh, this was one of the mystery <coughs> that what was was its uh, exact mechanism and how it was made but it was a very early example of a automated machine or an even uh, we can say it an analog computer which was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance how it was made and uh, that still probably was not well known it's kept in the national archaeological museum in athens and it was found in a shipwreck and according to various sources the it was made around 80 bc to 150 or 200 bc So, so far we were talking mostly about uh, europe or uh, more uh, maybe we can say the latin christian uh, europe if we look beyond uh, europe this automated uh, automata or auto uh, machines with uh, self moving parts uh, this was already well known so in ancient egypt bc 16 to 15 uh, this uh, statues with moving head played important role in their religious ceremonies and mentioned by various pharaohs account uh, buddhist scholar doxuan uh, described humanoid automata and in indian uh, lokapannati there was story about how robotic agents uh, guarded a statue of uh, buddha and uh, in china also so chinese carpenter lu ban and uh, he <coughs> reported making of mechanical uh, imitations of animals and demons with moving part and uh, developing uh, human and automata as uh, early as uh, 4th century c and uh, 
in the left side you can see a picture of Raja Bhoj, who uh, um, who uh, reported this um, Samaranga Sutradhara, uh, son, uh, Sanskrit uh, treatise uh, during his uh, dynasty, and which includes uh, descriptions of mechanical bees and parts and fountains shaped like humans, animals, etc. The Muslim uh, or Islamic uh, in the Islamic world uh, in the Middle East, Ismail al Zazari, Zazari, he was uh, pretty famous on making several automated devices. So here you can see one of his uh, mechanical toy. And uh, <coughs> al Zazari also reported uh, making of various uh, humanoid automata. Um, uh, there was a famous story of uh, about a waitress and uh, it was so human like that uh, when he showed it in the, his uh, king's or caliph's court that even uh, some started flirting with it and later he when the caliph got so angry he re uh, revealed that this is not a human and it's actually a human and automata so what happened to the guys who flirt with it that is not uh, written in wikipedia but we can just speculate that and then uh, this automata or uh, mechanical uh, toys, they started migrating from this uh, non-European region towards the mainstream European region, which started to get uh, documented into uh, Latin literature and uh, Greek literature. So some of these migration happened during the Alexander the Great's travel and conquest around BC 300, and he reported uh, many magnificent animals and uh, features of the Indian continent, which also include uh, elaborate descriptions of uh, mechanical agents, uh, mechanical bots and so on. And also Megasthenes uh, visit to India also uh, reported existence of such uh, automated toys in uh, various king's courts. And there was this uh, story about that King Ashoka, but he exchanged uh, uh, <coughs> uh, he exchanged ambassadors with his uh, Greek counterpart, I think Ptolemy II, and they exchanged various gifts and he also quest for an automated uh, robotic army for uh, protecting the Buddha statue. And another uh, important exchange happened, uh, this uh, Charlemagne, uh, he was, uh, uh, and his barons uh, traveled to Constantinople and they were uh, completely uh, mesmerized with the automated mechanism exist uh, like automated fountain etc which are <coughs> uh, exist in the um, king's court at constantinople and uh, they were also gifted some this type of automated toys which they bring back and uh, gradually the superstition or supernatural abilities associated with uh, automata that started to reduce in the main uh, Europe, although it uh, stayed along for the, during the most part of the medieval Europe, and also the appearance of um, Mongols in the Balkans regions that also helped in exchange of these uh, resources, even uh, including these uh, details of uh, automated toys and uh, mechanical toys between the mainstream uh, mainland Europe and the. Middle East and the Far East like uh, India and China. And uh, <coughs> the Caliph of Baghdad, Harun al Rashid, he gifted this uh, water clock on the left side uh, to uh, this uh, Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, here also, uh, this water clock was equipped with various uh, automated mechanism, which were uh, that time was not well known in the European uh, context. And they took uh, great astonishment on uh, how uh, this thing works. And often it was uh, associated with the magical powers of the uh, foreigners. And here you can see various examples of uh, humanoid robots, mostly in the form of uh, robotic guards. So the humanoid robots were uh, initially made for uh, guarding purpose. So here you can see. And they, uh, from the beginning of making humanoid robots, you can see that they were depicted 
with uh, non-human quality, like they do not have clothes or they have uh, bigger body parts, while uh, the human counterpart is uh, drawn uh, with clothes and uh, appropriately to uh, kind of showcase the cons um, contrast and also create fear in the human part about these uh, robotic guards or uh, humanoids. But <laughs> these uh, robots uh, or automa automata is not always uh, related to or purposed for creating fear. So has been, uh, it was, I think presently it is in uh, Belgium or uh, France and the Burgundian uh, region. So it was uh, very famous for its uh, gardens and uh, it's known as Marvels of Hesdin. And uh, it was constructed and then uh, restored by multiple rulers uh, of that time. And it con consists of uh, various automated uh, agents like automatic uh, water jets, uh, trick mirrors uh, with um, automated uh, or mechanical animals, rotating house and so on. And uh, it was created for recreation purpose. So you can see the various uh, purpose of making automated agents, starting from creating fear through humanoid uh, uh, avatars to just create recreation or making something for gifting purpose like water clock or uh, mechanical fountains and so on. The word automata was actually uttered or reported by Francois Rebellius, the French Renaissance writer, and in his book in Gargantua, he defined the term automate to denote a machine with self-contained principle of motion. So still now we are not talking about robot, even though we are in the 14th or 15th century. And uh, also this automata, it also later on uh, kind of uh, bifurcated into multiple disciplines. So later on, we will look at uh, the history of artificial intelligence also, and uh, which also coming from automata and maybe uh, from research on uh, human psychology and so on. But uh, on early days, the automata was defined as a machine with self-contained principle of motion. And <clears throat> Later on, although earlier we were mostly talking about uh, automata in the context of mechanical animals, mega toys or uh, humanoid soldiers, etc. But then uh, this uh, automata also took the form of oracular head and here again uh, superstitions or supernatural ability got mixed up with uh, automated agents. So, Pope uh, Sylvester II earlier, known as uh, Jarbart earlier, he is credited with making the first oracular head. On his days, he was uh, reported to be a great scholar and he was tutor of the son of early Roman emperor. And he made one uh, oracular head, which uh, people believe to have supernatural ability. And later on, uh, there were stories about uh, Roger Bacon's uh, brazen head. One famous quoting is time is time was time is past. It said that uh, Roger Bacon made this brazen head, which has supernatural ability of predicting future. But once he was sleeping and uh, then the brazen head was self destroyed by lightning. And before it was destroyed, it uttered this phrase to his uh, uh, servant. And um, there were uh, some drama about uh, drama or stories written about Roger Bacon's present hit, which uh, becomes quite popular in uh, medieval literature. So <clears throat> around 1495-15th uh, century, so this is a humanoid uh, robot reconstructed uh, from the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. It was said that he uh, demonstrated this humanoid robot in a uh, show there which have which uh, this humanoid robot can make human like hand movement it has a human like jaw and it also can make some uh, greetings gesture and the drawing was later recovered in 1950s from leonardo da vinci's uh, collections uh, this is known as the tour talk make it the made in middle uh, uh, middle east and this is one uh, chinese uh, humanoid robot which can automatically soft tea to its guest 
So now if we coming back from 1400, 1500, we can take a bigger jump. Uh, so earlier we were talking about this uh, oracular head of Pope Sylvester II, George the uh, Orgar Jarward earlier. He also made this uh, abascus and he was very proficient with uh, Middle Eastern Arabic languages. And uh, this uh, mechanical calculator he made by studying Arabic literature. And interestingly, it doesn't have a zero. So it has one to nine. The middle picture is of uh, Pascal, Louis Pascal. So we all read about Pascal um, in our um, high school physics book about this uh, equivalence of water pressure or equivalence of fluid pressure. Uh, Pascal's uh, father was a local tax collector and Pascal makes several models of mechanical calculator to help his father in the tax calculation process. So later on he was granted also a French equivalent of royal patent for his design. So this is one of uh, Pascal's calculator which also has carry forward feature and uh, this is one John Napier's calculator. So on initial days uh, uh, this uh, when computing becomes important for hum humankind. So uh, many uh, scholars, they started designing mechanical calculator. So this is uh, Charles Babbage and his uh, analytical machine. So remember, we also talked about this Antikythera mechanism, which we uh, mentioned about the maybe the first analog computer, but this is the first uh, working analog computer of our uh, age. And uh, Charles Babbage's work was greatly hampered by the World War. But when he was making this computer, so this lady, her name is uh, Lady Ada of Lovelace. She is the daughter of the famous uh, romantic poet uh, Lord Byron. And uh, Lord Byron, uh, although he was a very famous romantic poet, but his personal life was very disturbed and his wife blamed it to the, his love to literature. And she taught uh, mathematics to their daughter. And Lady Ada Lovelace is credited to be the first programmer of the world and she when she heard about Charles Babbage's work she developed the first programming language for a computer and it's still known as ADA uh, in memory of her name. So the term robot was uttered much later in the 1920s and you can see that the term robot is often associated with uh, forced labor. And here I also make a statement about this uh, robot patents or imperial decrease. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was also about abolishing compulsory uh, labor by uh, SAF. So uh, although the term automata is uttered much earlier, but the term robot came much later and it was not initially associated with automated agents or androids rather it was more associated with uh, forced labor or the purpose. Now from since we are talking about automata and uh, robots so uh, it's uh, be interesting to look at the history of uh, artificial intelligence because when you are uh, learning robotics and uh, robotic control navigation etc all you are going uh, deep into or diving deep into all these uh, reinforcement learning, path learning, etc. So artificial intelligence, it was initially started with the same stream of making automata, but then development in other fields like in um, computer science programming, Turing test, that also influence uh, the development of artificial intelligence and uh, formal reasoning or uh, the more uh, the way of uh, knowledge representation that also uh, influence this uh, symbolic school of thoughts in artificial intelligence. Although the term artificial intelligence started or became popular uh, after this 1956 workshop at Dartmouth College, which was attended by many stalwarts of the, uh, that time. And one output from that is the general problem solver by uh, Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, about which we will look at in the upcoming slides. And often intelligence is defined as uh, goal-directed adaptive behavior. And uh, if a machine could carry on a conversation, 
uh, over a teleprinter that was indistinguishable from a conversation with a human being, then it was reasonable to say that the machine was thinking. And we still uh, this uh, statement from this uh, famous Turing test, and even in the recent time also some uh, papers have started to come out as a visual Turing test. And the visual Turing test is uh, where you cannot uh, distinguish a real object from a synthetic object. And uh, papers in uh, virtual reality or computer graphics, they are started uttering this term visual Turing test. And also, but we will later look at uh, research on chatbot or expert system, which were once upon a time mainstream research field in AI, which are again trying to develop this type of automated agents. So here you can see a shift in gear that earlier for automated agents we are mostly talking about uh, mechanical hydraulic pneumatic systems where you have a physical system which has self-contained uh, moving parts but now we are shifting gear that we are talking about uh, computing agents which are not uh, physical agents which are pretending to be automated agents so these are examples of some early computers on uh, left hand side is the INIAC computers in Harvard and, and uh, I think um, <coughs> it was uh, one of the purpose of these uh, INIAC computers of predicting trajectories of uh, moving objects. Uh, right hand side it's the HSAC computer uh, developed at Cambridge Computer Laboratory. If you ever go there, a recent project actually operationalized the one later version of uh, it's a computer and I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, meet the developer of his and uh, Maurice Wilkes. So during World War he with other uh, like Alan Turing and others were working on uh, code breaking German code breaking. But in parallel he also developed this it's a computer and the it's a computer is credited to be the first stored program computer where you can store a set of instruction and it will uh, repeatedly do that. It sounds trivial in today's age but uh, that time it was one of the breakthrough research and thereafter many newer versions of its computers were developed for Cambridge Cavendish Laboratory or the Department of Physics and so far I remember also a, a local bread factory also uh, or <coughs> grocery shop also showed interest on automatic their calculation using the its computer. So <coughs> from making computers Another branch in uh, AI or automata which was popular is simulating human action. And in that context, uh, in uh, this uh, 1950s, uh, four, I think, uh, so far I remember, or 1950 maybe, this Warren McCool and Walter Pitts uh, paper on this um, logical calculus for nervous activity, where they first proposed the model of neurons and neural network and showed them to solve uh, digital logic and it pioneers these uh, research stream which now we tell about uh, biology inspired computing neural network deep learning etc so they pioneered on developing uh, computational agent which can do human like activity and in similar context i put a picture of paul fitz and his famous uh, paper on fitz law and at that time in 1954 that uh, many uh, scientific community was greatly influenced by Claude Shannon's work on information theory and he also uh, used that famous logarithmic uh, principle of P log P on predicting movement time between uh, two targets and uh, for long this Paul uh, Fitz law was kind of mysterious because they are from 19. Uh, 60s onward till 1980s or even early 90s there were multiple explanation came up with advancement of uh, sensors and measuring human activity that why this particular law law predicting uh, human movement time from target size and distance works we will later see in our uh, cognition motor action uh, lecture about uh, explanation of fitz law and it was become more popular and well known to the computer scientist when uh, Stuart Card used this law to predict to Xerox that a mouse happened to be the or mouse will be the most uh, easy to use device compared to joystick, touchpad or trackball. And then uh, Xerox started marketing mouse which was followed by other uh, 
vendor soon and still now mouse is a de facto standard for computer interaction and there are several uh, research community known as fits law research researchers so although macula uh, and fits uh, model and then the fits law or the hicks law then uh, there are uh, several models of vision exist and theories of uh, memory exist so there were uh, this uh, research on experimental psychology and partly on artificial intelligence also it got fragmented on modeling human activity and this modeling of human activity also later uh, cons um, contributed towards uh, developing robots because with uh, advancement of electronics and hardware we can also um, being able to incorporate thinking ability into an automated machine so earlier uh, models in medieval time those are only mechanical they didn't have at, as such this uh, thinking ability but with uh, advancement of electronics psychology and computing instruments it is now possible to add thinking ability to the robotic agents which was earlier claimed by this uh, hafistas uh, fembots which has uh, skills of sense or uh, they are endowed with skills of sense and um, consciousness etc was uh, written by homer so Alan Newell in 1972, uh, he presented a paper at Carnegie Mellon Symposium on Cognition saying you can't play 20 questions with the nature and win. And there he proposed to combine these theory, multiple fragmented theories of cognition into a single holistic picture. And he also wrote a book which is known as Unified Theories of Cognition and purposefully he named the book as unified theories because he already foresee that there may not be a single theory which combines uh, existing fragmented theories of cognition. So he encourages making multiple theories, but what he proposed that we should try to combine all these theories into a single agent so that uh, since a human is a single thing. So if in future we make a automated humans or humanoid, we cannot have separate separate models for its uh, cognition, motor action, uh, memory action, vision, etc. We should try to create a single model which explains everything. So later on, uh, in from 1960s, a good part of AI research took the form of developing expert systems where again, uh, if you remember the Turing test that uh, we can have a conversation with an automated agent and the human cannot distinguish it from its um, computing or automated counterparts. So Dendral is one of the early example of such an expert system in 1916 that used to identify chemical composition uh, with a series of interaction with user in the form of uh, command language. And uh, later on, a more popular system was ELISA system, or you can tell the very early type of chatbot system. So it was kind of walked like a psychological doctor and it was uh, will be running a conversation with you. And on the right side, if you look at the conversation, many times it's repeating what you are telling. So it's developed at MIT and it was one of the first chatterbots or a first program capable of attempting the Turing test that you cannot uh, distinguish that whether you are talking with a human or a automated agent and then this uh, mycin was uh, developed at stanford and uh, still now there is a e extended or enhanced version of mycin and it turns out to that mycin was made for an automatic diagnosis system and still now we are uh, undertaking a lot of research on the tele robotics uh, Telinars, which uh, in the later part of the course you will be introduced to it. And Mycin took such a initial attempt without any uh, actual physical prototype, just a automated agent written in the Lisp uh, that <coughs> to replace a human doctor. And some limited uh, user study shows that it can actually outperform a human doctor. But then it also raised a lot of ethical questions that whether uh, it is ethical to be treated by a automated agent and uh, that ethical question still now is valid or is getting revisited. So you may time to time read about that 
Australia is uh, passing legislation to grant patent to a robotic agent. Then in automated uh, vehicle community, there is a famous problem known as Molly problem that if an automated vehicle uh, hit a passenger, which a, hit a sorry, pedestrian or a, another uh, walking person outside the vehicle, whose fault is it? Is it the guy who is inside the car or the guy who developed the program or the person who tested it? And there were a few accidents about with the automated vehicle and it again uh, rolls back to these ethical and legal issues that when we will deploy an automated agent, do we have the regulations or legal framework behind it which can support if something goes wrong? So coming back to uh, this um, automating human uh, cognition process. So the expert systems basically they try to uh, mimic the human reasoning process, mostly using symbolic logic. And that was started by this Harvard Simon and Alan Dingwell, so this general problem solver, which was uh, something called an automatic theorem prover. So if uh, any of you did a course on a finite, uh, this automata system, you know what is theorem prover. Some uh, very sim simple language, it's something like uh, if you if I know A implies B and B implies C, then I can imply A implies C. So uh, going through first order logic statements and using this symbol logic, the symbolic uh, processing, uh, Alan Newell proposed this model human processor, which attempted to model the whole human cognitive and perceptual motor system. And it has a part called working memory, which has visual image store and auditory image store and all information was stored at first order logic statement and whenever uh, we perceive something that uh, add a uh, first order logic statement to the working memory and then the it execute this first order logic statement and it uh, executes an action for the motor processor and the human execute that action and then it the similar stimuli changes and again it uh, adds new statements to the uh, working memory. So uh, it is easy to implement, easy to understand. And also uh, he associated uh, timing with all of these uh, activities and adding this timing, we uh, theoretically we can predict the task completion time for any activity. And this model human processor later was uh, published in this book on this, the psychology of human computer interaction published in 1984, I super remember. If not, it's 85. And from that, this uh, other field this human computer interaction that took birth. And uh, <clears throat> in 1980s, uh, IBM launched this uh, personal computer and uh, the development of computer was very uh, similar or uh, simulate the development of robots also that earlier what was happened to be a tool in laboratory like the NIA or set system that becomes a consumer electronic products and also if we look at uh, my borrow this uh, particular uh, picture from a presentation by professor brad mars and here on the left hand side, uh, the development of various interactive system like direct manipulation of graphical objects, mouse, windows, text editing, hypertext, gesture recognition. Uh, those has been uh, described in terms of university research, corporate research and commercial product. And the black solid bar is showing uh, university research. Then the striped bar is corporate research and the transparent white body is uh, commercial product. And you can see that obviously the university research preceded the corporate research. And uh, what happened that uh, around 1985, like uh, some time similar when the uh, book Psychology of Human Computer Interaction was published, all uh, commercial uh, products uh, started to be launched. And <clears throat> this is the time when the interaction becomes important. So earlier uh, when we are talking about mechanical bots or even this expert system, uh, the interaction was many times uh, one way that you press a switch, move a screw and the things uh, automatically showing you something. Then comes the computing systems where the input was taken in terms of typing on a keyboard using a command interface. But now in 1985 onward, when computers becomes more uh, common type, 
here now we are um, giving more emphasis or research uh, development everything started more on interactive system and in the rest part of the human ro robot interaction course we will look at both existing and innovative interactive style by which we can communicate with an automated agent or a robot in the context it will be uh, also interesting to note about this uh, immersive user experience that moving on to give a full trying to offer a full immersive experience to user so on the left side here you can see a pet picture from a patent which was filed around or granted around august 28 1962 so even before uh, <clears throat> research on uh, personal computer or computers become commonplace and uh, the sensorama simulator tried to simulate a situation of bike riding through new york streets and it has 3d vision and gust of wind and vibration aromas although it was not commercially successful but still it considered as one of the first virtual reality systems which was actually implemented and the middle picture is uh, by Ivan Sutherland sort of Damocles system and this is created as the first head mounted display system and the analogy is in uh, Greek mythology I think there was a famous king as Damocles and his uh, disciples were very envy of him so one day he make one of his uh, disciples a king and he wanted to give him a feeling that how it feels that he take a single strain from a horse's tail and hang a sword above his head with the single strain when he's uh, the disciple was sitting on the throne and the message was that uh, great power comes with also with a great uh, risk and you always have a feeling a sword is hanging on your system the analogy here was that that time the hardware was so bulky that the whole head mounted system cannot be done on its own but it has to be hung from the wall just like this sword of Damocles and someone has to enter into the system. Ivan Sutherland's PhD uh, research was also very uh, famous and uh, it was on uh, sketchpad or developing the first uh, sketch recognition system and uh, recently his uh, dissertation was also restored by the Cambridge Computer Laboratory. And the right extreme right side system is the Boeing systems. Uh, this is uh, first time when the word augmented reality was uttered. And uh, this is a demonstration <coughs> of uh, looking through the skin of a passenger aircraft or passenger aircraft and looking through the skin of the aircraft and uh, maintaining the inner working of the aircraft. So someone donning this headset, he can see through the skin and can maintain this uh, inner um, circuitry. So uh, that was in 1991. So <clears throat> in this context, now I am uh, going to present our own research on uh, or case study on uh, immersive media for intelligent human robot interaction. So uh, do anyone have any question at this point? I can pause for some time. OK. Um, um, yeah, so uh, maybe I will uh, move on. So in our lab around uh, 2019 uh, summer onward, we started working on uh, developing a human robot interactive system with uh, immersive media. The first example we develop with a DIY robotic kit and a video see through interface. So uh, here this is the DIY robotic kit cost as low as uh, 2000 rupees or around 20 dollars. This is a tablet and uh, from the, the view of the back camera was rendered on the screen. So there is no other control on the screen. This is a eye gaze tracker. And uh, these uh, red dots are the illuminators of the eye gaze tracker. It tracks eye gaze and we develop bespoke program to control a screen pointer with this eye gaze. And this is a leap motion controller, so it can be used for hand tracking or gesture recognition. Again, we developed a bespoke program to control a screen pointer with uh, hand finger movement. 
and then we develop a multimodal program which uh, takes both the eye gaze and finger movement of the user uh, into account and controls the screen uh, screen pointer based on one so first what we did that uh, we this robot had uh, two servo motors so we uh, developed a very simple uh, four way control mechanism so if uh, vinoy looks right or left the red dot goes there along with the screen pointer and the robot uh, manipulator goes left or right and then manually you can put an object on it and it will uh, deliver the object to you and similarly we can make it uh, up and down so here he is giving a card and it is uh, delivering to her and uh, vinoy can uh, was controlling it looking left or right or an operator can uh, control the screen pointer either with eye gaze or finger movement and uh, as the screen pointer going left right up and down the robot uh, manip robotic manipulator is doing that and we uh, mostly hard coded this uh, amplitude of movement or uh, within the robots walking on the so we did not implement as such uh, any kinematics uh, equation what we did that we want the robotic agent to move at any designated point within its walking envelope so uh, we implemented a very simple algorithm that uh, we use this uh, robot it's known as robot magician so it has a software development kit which can tell uh, the robot's end effector's position within its own working envelope so we are manually bringing the robot's end uh, effector uh, which is visible in this uh, video see through display and when wherever it is robots uh, end effector is we are clicking the mouse pointer on the screen and in effect what we are getting that for nine points we are getting the coordinates in the screen coordinate system where the origin is at top left corner and the x and y are this way horizontal and vertical and also the x y z within the robots uh, coordinate system which is different from the screen coordinate system and then uh, we just uh, learned a simple linear regression model which mapped the screen coordinates into robots coordinate system and by that we can click at any position on the screen and the robot can move to that location after making that we uh, make some good use of the robot so we took the system to the vidya sagar earlier known as the spastic society of india in chennai and we worked with a bunch of uh, students who are quadriplegic mostly due to cerebral palsy means that they cannot move their body parts they can uh, interact with a computer or other uh, humans also only through eye gaze and we developed this video see through interface by which they can control this robotic control uh, manipulator through their eye gaze and it need not to be always uh, continuous human input so uh, since we can map the screen coordinate system to the robot's workspace we can also write graphics algorithm by which the robot will follow a specific object of a particular size and shape within its working envelope and then we can also do uh, different activity with the robot so for example here we are instructing the robot to stamp and press again we can pass this instruction through i guess gesture or any other means so equipped with that we again uh, took this uh, robot magician system to this uh, spastic society and uh, they are we developed an interesting software which kind of combines both uh, deep learning and uh, classical machine learning so instead of an eye tracker we used uh, or commercial eye tracker we used a uh, web camera and one of our student raghavendra murthy he developed a deep learning model through which we can estimate i guess from web camera feed and using this video see through interface that uh, girl she can control this robotic arm only using the webcam so around uh, in 2020 summer this work got a lot of uh, media attention and still now you can read about this work just by writing i guess control robot and you can read about it in ndtv all india radio and various other uh, media outlets and from robot we moved on to mobile robots so the robot need not to be fixed on bench 
So here we again started our research with uh, cheaper uh, system. So we took a just a normal uh, toy car. We bought it from Big Bazaar. Again, it was as low as uh, $20. And uh, we can uh, train the car to follow a particular object, like here these uh, red dots. Or we can uh, instruct it uh, through our IES gesture to reach a destination using this video see-through interface. And the same thing, we can also do it for drone. Now, from this video see-through interface, we moved on and uh, also uh, we felt the need of making uh, this robotic controller intelligent in terms of obstacle avoidance. So whenever we are putting a robotic agent near a, a human, or when it is sharing its workspace with human, it is important that uh, the human operator is safe. So we uh, developed a Markov decision process based algorithm, which we will uh, teach uh, later part in the course. And we uh, train the robotic agent that if there is a human body part, in this case the hand, it will avoid that when it is reaching the destination. And again, we our initial testing happened with this desktop robot. But the same algorithm can easily be uh, <clears throat> transformed to mobile robots, both uh, ground moving and um, the flying ones. So from uh, video see through 2D interface, we moved on to develop mixed reality interface, in which case we can create 3D objects using a Microsoft HoloLens. So in the later part of the course, we will also show you uh, HoloLens uh, using HoloLens and HoloLens simulator. So here we make a very simple four-way control as we make with uh, uh, during 2019 with our uh, video see-through interface. So there are four buttons and the robot can go left, right, up and down using these four buttons. And these four buttons were rendered using HoloLens and we developed system to communicate between the HoloLens and the robot, which was initially not trivial, but then we sorted it out. And after making this four-way controller, we again developed mapping mechanism by which we can uh, instruct the robot to move at a specific point <clears throat> and the instruction can come through the mixed reality headset. So here the robot is uh, tr trying to follow this uh, green uh, cuboid within its walking envelope and the uh, instruction is given through the hollow lens. And after our initial research with the desktop robotic agent, which is safe and easy to uh, control, we move on to uh, mobile robots and uh, <coughs> we again use the, our same car and we develop these uh, holograms using hollow lens and we can move the car left, right, up and down, just the basic four-way control Stop. using the HoloLens. And then we can make more elaborate imagery using HoloLens and control the car either using fingers, uh, gesture or by eye gaze and can move it uh, left, right, up and down. And presently, uh, Aja is working on replacing this car with an uh, appropriate a mobile robot or a turtle bot system where we are also implementing the obstacle avoidance feature so that it doesn't run into a virtual obstacle. And if whatever we can do with a ground vehicle, we can also play with a flying vehicle. So here again, we create this hologram buildings and a human operator can put on this HoloLens and he can fly this drone through this hologram building. So say, for example, you were in a warehouse and you are developing a navigation system so that your drone doesn't collide with any object or you are just developing a delivery drone, but you want to test it in your lab before going into the field. So you can create these holographic buildings and test your navigation algorithms with respect to these holograms or HoloLens. Right. 
So to summarize uh, today's uh, introductory talk, that initially automata refers to machines with self-contained or self-sustaining principle of motion, and uh, mechanical, pneumatic, or hydraulic automated machines started to appear in uh, mythology and also in uh, documented form from 300 BC, BC or earlier. Unfortunately, many of the literature outside Europe was not properly documented or uh, those are not properly stored, which is a shame. And early systems took the form of humanoid animals, birds, and the purpose was guarding decoration, showing supernatural ability with this um, humanoid heads, astronomical calculation as we looked at this antiquated mechanism. And later on with um, progress in research in psychology and computing systems, that uh, research uh, steered into modeling human mind or more uh, correct technical term is human cognition. And the present research is also looking at uh, giving the robotic or automated agents the human like feeling. So it can be as trivial as uh, automatic navigation from that uh, we are also working on giving the sense of touch, feeling, even uh, some um, <clears throat> ambitious research is also looking at giving consciousness to robots and so on. So uh, in 1950s uh, or 1950s onward, a lot of research worked on modeling human mind. And now we are trying to combine this research on uh, mechanical agents or uh, physical uh, research with research in the computing domain or artificial intelligence and try to combine them uh, together. And some results are already coming in the form of automated vehicles and uh, humanoid robots with uh, think, um, kind of pretending to have thinking ability and so on. And uh, maybe the in the last slide, here I uh, just uh, copy pasted, sorry, I just copy pasted these themes from the ACM IEEE HRI 2022 conference. So um, oh, it's sorry about that. The first line, unfortunately, you cannot read because this is occluding. Yeah, now we can read it. Uh, so the themes uh, on the full paper submission uh, website was human robot interaction user studies technical advances in human robot interaction human robot interaction design theory and methods in human robot interaction and a new theme was added in 2022 as systems which uh, investigating or describing how underlying techniques come together to achieve system level hri behavior so when you will also do your course project on hri i think you can uh, look at this uh, website and see that which uh, field um, your research is uh, mostly tuned to, and it may be more than one field. And also uh, in this presentation, uh, I try to uh, emphasize that how the automata or robots, uh, they came into existence from ancient time to medieval time, and how the human uh, interaction with it gradually evolved and uh, for a long time till 15th century in Western Europe, the term robot was often associated with supernatural abilities and uh, magical abilities. And still now that feeling somehow exists and also the term literally meant in early 19th century is forced labor. And when you are uh, expecting empathy from a robot, that is something like a, um, getting oxymoron with the term that uh, we are instead of forced labor, we are trying to generate an empathetic feeling with the robot. But then if you think about the movie Wally, -E, that uh, in that movie uh, we are, uh, it's showing more human abilities in the robot or human feelings in the robot. And so it becomes very important for a HRI course that not to look at only about the technical aspect of robot, but also about the interaction and social aspect of the robot. And in that context, uh, this, uh, uh, I think Sridatta is there, the Sridatta or Dr. Pandey, they will uh, more introduce you that when, uh, how we investigate uh, scientifically, 
this empathy or affect or association or relationship between humans and robots. So anyway, I think I already passed uh, our stipulated time. It's uh, 10 or 9. So I will stop recording and stop talking. And uh, if anyone has any question, um, you can go ahead. Thank you. Yeah.